All right, my first area of interest here, Stephen, is your Twitter profile. It says Gravity Lover. Tell me more about that. It's uh, if it, it, that's an inside comment for action sport athletes. Okay. Uh, action sports are gravity games. Yeah. And so um, I'm a I'm a huge action sports fan, and everything sort of I personally do for me to you know clear my head and, and stay pre present on this planet involves hurling myself down mountains at high speeds. Well, and that's why I picked it out. Mine is too. My, my primary focus is mountain biking. And uh, that's where my flow happens, which we'll, we'll get into. Though I also like the, uh, as we were talking before we started here and issues of, of faith, that's one it's always, as we talk about mystery, I thought, you know, it's hard. I keep gravitating away from all these hard black and white truths. Gravity still ranks really high for me as one. Um, I haven't, I haven't quite decided to put that in the mystery realm. It seems pretty concrete. I think it's, I, it, there are mysteries, right? There, uh, there are. There are around, around gravity. Um, but it's a, uh, the, you know, the, the, the thing is, you know, as a mountain biker, that's wonderful. It makes action sports so wonderful is whatever it looks like from the outside, from the inside, it feels like you're dancing with the primal forces that create yes. the universe. Right. That's what the feeling is. It's a it's and it, and if you're interested in giant mystery powers, for lack of a better term, right? Like I think everybody who got into action sports in some way wanted like a level of intimacy with mountains, with forests, with yeah. nature, with gravity, that somehow these activities seem to provide in a way that doesn't like, you know. Skiing is my one of my great passions, and I and I do realize that I'm slapping, strapping planks to my feet and sliding down. Like I, I do get physically that that's what's going on, but that's not actually what's happening at all. And um, what's hap what feel it feels like on the inside is of that I'm you know I get to dance or play with these primal forces at a level that you know is normally not available to to anybody. I, I like the term dancing. People are always sending me the crazy videos of people doing stuff. I, I don't watch them. Uh, it gives me so much anxiety because I know what uh, landing poorly feels like. I don't want to watch those. But I also tell them, you know, watching that stuff is so much scarier than doing it. I don't want to watch the mountain bike guy doing crazy stuff, but put me on the mountain bike and I'm comfortable because that's where I can dance. That's again, where I'm in flow. So what's been your latest adventure? Uh, my latest adventure, I'm, it's literally, uh, it's a ski thing. And I, um, I have been trying to learn a bunch of uh, free uh, new school ski tricks, nose butters and nose butter 360s and, you know, things that you probably shouldn't be doing in your fifties. Um, it, it, but uh, I, I do consistently. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's what I've been doing a lot. Your Instagram. So I'm just looking, I like the labels that people give themselves or the titles that they give themselves. And on there it's world leader and peak performance, which I understand. And we'll talk about here and disruptive technology. I want to know about that piece, disruptive technology. So my expertise, the book we're, you know, going to talk about is called the art of impossible. And the, the reason is I've spent 30 years, my, my adult career studying those moments in time when the impossible became possible, when those things that have never been done got done. And basically writing books about what I discovered and, and using the tools of, of neuroscience and psychology to kind of understand what's going on in the brain and the body when people are doing this. Whenever you see the impossible become possible, in my experience, you tend to see the intersection of two things. Somebody figuring out how to harness accelerating disruptive technology and disruptive is a technical term coined by uh, Clayton Christensen. Uh, disruptive means a technology that uh, displaces an existing technology market or service. So uh, vacuum tubes were disrupted by silicon chips okay. when we created the computer. The record store was disrupted by iTunes, right? Those kinds of things. So you see people harnessing disruptive accelerating technology and finding ways to extend human capability. So I've yeah. written six books on the technology side, seven books on the human capability side. And that's, so that's, that's the bulk of where I've lived my whole life. But I think you have to look at both those components. 
with this book, The Art of Impossible, you obviously have been on this path of impossible high performance for a long time. How would you define the difference in this book? Is it your effort to drill it down to a formula? Is that a fair encapsulation? Formula, yeah, it is. It, formula is a fair encapsulation, but let me put a little context around that. Yeah. Peak performance, anything we, when we say peak performance, there's nothing more or less going on than getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. Okay. And that biology is a vast yet limited tool set. Meaning when you talk about what are the things that you can actually optimize and, and the focus of Art of Impossible is predominantly cognitive peak performance. It's the predominantly the mental half of the equation. There are some physical things in the book, but that's not a primary area of interest. What this book is, is first of all, the a full, every, a lot of people have aspects of this puzzle. They have focus or gratitude or mindset or mindfulness or grit or, and the deep expertise, amazing books flow. And I've written some of those books, right? But this is the first book I think that uses a neuroscience based approach. And the big deal about neuroscience, why neuroscience matters so much, psychology is ultimately a metaphor. It's a metaphor for a neurobiological process. That's the actual mechanism. And if you're really trying to reliable, repeatable change that works for everybody, um, you want to take things down to the level of neurobiology because it's a shared mechanism shaped by evolution, shared by all humans, works for everyone. Based on that limit, that, that parameters, yes, there is a formula for impossible. There, impossible, when e human beings are designed to take, designed literally biologically to tackle high, hard challenges. We were really built for that. And to do that, there are, there's, there's motivation, which is a catch-all term. When psychologists say motivation, they're talking about external motivation, extrinsic motivators, money, sex, fame, internal motivators, passion, purpose, ma the urge towards mastery, goal setting, and grit. That's what psychologists mean when they talk about motivation. So whenever the biology starts with motivation, of course it does, because that's what gets you into the game right? Learning is the thing that, and the skill sets that fall under that, that, that category is what comes next. That's what allows you to continue to play in a sense. Creativity, especially if you're going after high, hard goals, where how do you get there exactly is not clearly mapped, is how you steer. And flow, which is the last element in, in, the, in our biology, is the, the state of optimal performance is essentially how you turbo boost everything kind of beyond all reasonable expectations. That, so use that form, that's, from that perspective, yes, there is a formula. This is a book that, what's different about this book than every other book I've ever written is, this is the first time I've written a how-to. This is the book everybody's been wanting me to write for 20 years, and I kept saying, well, I'll, when the research, when the science is there, I will absolutely write this book. The science has not, been completely there until the past four or five years. But most of the gaps have been filled in, filled in and we can now go, wait a minute. There's not, it's not just, you know, there's not just a formula, there's an order to the process. The, it's a system. System was designed to work in a certain way in a certain order. And if you can get the system working for you, the whole point is you go farther, faster with a whole lot less effort. What was the last gap filled in for you that then made this book possible? The last gap, I can tell you the last, the last discovery, this is, this is not the exact answer you're looking for, but it is, um, it, it was the, the most, the two most surprising things to me in writing this book, right? Um, the first was, oh my God, it's actually, there's an order and there's a sequence, like the discovery and, and the reason, by the way, it's worth just explaining this a little bit. Flow, as it, which is the focus, I run the Flow Research Collective. We study the neurobiology of peak human performance. We focus on flow. If you want to understand flow, you need to understand all the systems that are amplified by flow. Everything I just talked about is maximized by flow, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. 
So one of the reasons that I had this weird perspective and could see all this stuff is flow is the big catch-all. And if you're studying the big catch-all, you have to get, you have to have expertise in all these different areas because I focus on the neurobiology. That's what I was studying. And when you do that, which, you know, is not, not a lot of people do that. That's not scientists make their living studying one thing and going deeper and deeper macroscopic uh, perspectives doesn't tend to, that's not, that's not often, it's, hard, it's not rewarded in science, right? It's hard, it's not incentivized properly, basically. Yeah. Um, otherwise it would be done. Uh, but I happen to have that perspective. So that was the first thing, what, here's the crazy part. And let me, let me just give you one extra piece in the puzzle. When we talk about intrinsic motivation, uh, internal motivators, yeah. the big five, the f and they're, they work in an order, but their curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, which is the, basically the freedom to pursue, you know, your own desires, your, your own interests, and the mastery. It's the urge to get better and better at the things we do. Those are the big five intrinsic motivators. So this was the piece that blew my mind. Not only are we designed as, as a species to go big, it turns out not going big, not trying to live up to our full potential is really, really bad for us. And here's what I mean by that. Right now, anxiety and depression are at epidemic levels. The, the numbers, as I'm sure you know, one out of 10 adults is gonna come, is gonna deal with a, a, an incident of depression this year. Right. Somebody kills themselves once every 12 seconds. Uh, it's the number one kind of healthcare drain on our economies right now. This is a huge crisis. There are eight known major causes of anxiety and depression. Two of them get the most attention which are genetics. I, my genetics are wrong, so I can't produce enough serotonin and I can't be happy. And trauma, something terrible happened to me and I can't get past it. Those are the two that we talk about. But it turns out when you look under the hood at the data, genetics alone will never cause anxiety or depression. It's only always 50% of the equation, right? Nature, nurture, it's very much shared when it comes to that. And when it comes to trauma, if you look at the data, the vast majority of the time trauma leads to, to what's known as post-traumatic growth, not post-traumatic stress disorder. Something terrible happens and we build ourselves up. It's what Hemingway meant when he said, the world breaks everyone and afterward many are stronger at the broken places, right? That's the vast majority of what happens in trauma. The other six causes of depression are things like, for example, one of the big ones, lack of meaningful values or lack of meaningful work. You know what lack of meaningful work actually translates to when you, what does that mean? It means that work that you're not curious about, work that you're not passionate about, work that isn't lined up with your values and your purpose, yeah. work that doesn't afford you opportunities for mastery, work that doesn't um, give you autonomy where you can't steer your own ship, and work that doesn't produce flow. That's what it really means. If lack of meaningful values, that's a lack of passion and a lack of purpose and, and doing stuff that's not aligned with your core strengths. These are all... This is how the system was designed to work and not using it, not using it to rise to our full potential is actually really, really bad for us. So that was, it, yeah. that would, it's not surprising in a sense when you say it out loud, but finding it in the data, you know what I mean? And looking at all those systems, it, it, like sort of stumbling on it. That was shocking to me because I did not, I didn't go looking for that one. You know, that was one of those things that was like, I was just working on the book and working on all this stuff. And I was reading about trauma and depression on the side for other things I was working on that had to do with PTSD. I was not, and suddenly I'm looking at these major causes of anxiety and depression, and I'm realizing that they're the exact opposite of the things that I'm looking for, that I'm looking at in the art of impossible in terms of like the systems yeah. we're trying to get to work for us. Um, I was like, oh, that was shocking to me. So that's, I don't know if it's the last piece in the puzzle, but it was a really, I it loved, was sort of the eye-opening one. At I the love end. the paradigm shift. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think some of the most profound things, yeah, are the simplest, just like the risk we look of, the risk of what happened, what if I do X and we don't look at the risk of, yeah, but what if I stay here? And it brings me, it was page two of your book and I pulled it out because again, I don't know if it's uh, rocket science to look at it, but it's just so profound. You said the only thing more difficult than the emotional toil of pursuing true excellence is the emotional toil of not pursuing true excellence. And so when you bring up, yeah, despair and depression and what we have now, I see lack of purpose as the prime, as, as what I would say is the primary cause. And yet you said, yeah, the things that get the focus, uh, genetics and trauma, I say, I don't know where they are on the list, but I sure wouldn't put them as number one. 
Yeah, they're not. I mean, they're 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 seven and eight, at, but they get the mo- the genetics gets the most attention because the ph- the big pharmacological companies could make money, right? Trying to trying to sell pills that that fix that. Um, which uh, that's a totally different well, topic. Yeah, but and doesn't it, doesn't can't you put up there also? I mean, we've got to say as a humanity, we want to put them at the top of the list because it takes the responsibility off of us. It does. I agree. That's the other thing. And and trauma is um, we want our story, and I I want this for myself. Everybody wants this. We want to be seen, and we want our story to really matter, and. The problem with trauma anywhere is that it create it can create a victim mentality in people, and that literally uh, will crush peak performance. It uh, with it, it, there's something called there's very f- few foundationals in peak human performance, but one of them is what's known as a locus of control. This is the idea: if you have an internal locus of control, I am in control of my life, and I, you know. Maybe I, there's stuff that happens, of course, but as a general rule, I can steer my own life. And an external locus of control is life happens to me. I'm a victim. I can't do anything. And the minute you say life happens to me, I'm a victim. I can't do anything. You have literally given up your power neurobiologically. Your brain will not expend the energy to try. It won't. Like if you have a fixed mindset, for example, and you try to learn something, you can't learn it because your brain will not even bother burning the energy because it goes, well, you don't believe you can learn this. You can't learn this. So I'm not even going to try. Why would I burn the calories to try? The brain is an efficiency engine, right? It always wants to be as lean and mean as possible. And these are foundational problems. So my, not only do I think that, you know, the trauma and and, uh, genetics are um, the least important. I think that the culture that has been built up around them uh, is catastrophic. It's bad for us. Yeah. It's literally bad for us from a peak performance perspective, from a human performance perspective. It's just bad for us. I don't have any judgment one way or the other. I just know what works for us biologically. Yeah. Well, and you pulling out that you even mentioned a minute ago, you know, the things that you're doing after 50 and God bless you for that. Cause again, I'm, I pulled out a bunch of stuff that just struck me from your book. You said you're haunted by a quote from screenwriter Charlie Kaufman. When you're young, your potential is infinite. You might be anything, really. You might be Einstein, you might be DiMaggio. Then you get to an age when what you might be gives way to what you have been. You weren't Einstein, you weren't anything, and that is a bad moment. I I, I'm, I just turned 50 um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm so aware of how many of my peers now are talking about the things that they haven't done or that they will not continue to do. And it, it's crushing to me because I, I have so many more things I, I want to do. I mean, I understand it. I have compassion for it, but my gosh, I admittedly am fighting it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to look back. I don't want to get to the point of saying what I have not been. I mean, that's, that's a haunting is really a, a great term as you put it in there. Yeah, I, th- I, I don't know what I have to add to what you just said, because I agree, um, <laughs> right? I mean, I, you know, I, that quote really, and some people, it's funny because certain people hear that quote and their immediate response is, word I can't say on your show, Stephen, right? Like beep off Stephen, because yeah. they're like, look, it is hard enough just to be, I don't want to become, I don't want to have, I just want to be my, and all that is fair. You can totally say that you like, I, I will not, you know, won't get in your face in that. But as I said at the beginning, I like, I think it is harder to just sort of be than it is to try to become. I think the, I think the most I, I met, you know, the first thing that you brought up, which is the difficulty of not trying to live up to your potential is much greater than the actual difficulty of trying to live up to your full potential. Well, you, you said a minute ago, getting your biology to work for you uh, with that aspect. Again, you pulled out and, and I really, as I looked through your stuff, as I studied you and researched your work, I, well, I'll just ask you, it feels like you come down to two things and you put them in. I don't, I don't know if I got it out of your book or got it out of another, uh, another source, but you said two things. And I, the context was, you know, that mattered to you or that you keep continue to come to one, 
We are all capable of so much more than we know. And two, our potential is invisible, especially to ourselves. I mean, that's the crux of the personal development and self-help world, and maybe psychology as well is that, but I don't know as much as we talk about it, as much as we say that, are we as a humanity, as a culture, are we, do we really believe it or are we just running from it? I admit it. So it's interesting because the, the, the second one, which is the human potential is invisible, especially to ourselves. This is, um, this is a difficult, not obvious truth because of how we're wired. And like, there's a lot of research that goes into a statement like that. Let me just put some context around it. One, human potential, human capability is emergent. Right? We only find out what we're capable of by pushing our skills to the utmost again and again and again. Yeah. And unless you're willing to do that over and over and over and over again, you have no idea what you're capable of because it not only does it emerge that way, but it works like compound interest. So it's a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit, and then you start getting exponential growth down the line. And that is very invisible in the beginning, part one. Part two is, and this is uh, the second half, this is not predominantly my work, this is Adam Grant's work, a bunch of other people have worked on this, but we don't actually know what we're gonna like or be good at until we try things. We mm -hmm. cannot predict, you can't, you can't go to LeBron James and say, LeBron, I know you're a professional basketball player, one of the best athletes in the world, do you think you would like lacrosse? LeBron James cannot tell you if he's going to like another sport or be good at it, right? Ahead of time um, until he tries it and push himself a little bit until you're into it. We don't, we literally, we don't know what we're going to like. We don't know what we're going to good, good at. And we certainly don't know what we're capable of. No. We're super blind to our own capabilities, which is interesting. Well, it is. Uh, I've mentioned this multiple times on the show. It was, it was a long time ago. Franz Johansson, he's an author of The Medici Effect, and he talked about entrepreneurs. It was just, uh, just commenting on them, and he said one of the things he finds is they're not so special, so brilliant, whatever. They just are willing to try more things than the norm, which, yeah, I attest. I see the people who achieve the most, they expose themselves to so much more than the norm. But you talking about potential to push our potential to, to, to push ourselves to see where it is. And I'm back to sports, which you know this so well, if I'm doing that on the mountain bike, if you're doing that skiing to push and see what we're capable of, we have to risk injury and bottom line injury. And, and how many people want, there's a big cost there or there can be. There is a big cost and there can be, and I'm a guy, as you know, because you've read the book, who's broken a great number of bones. Yeah, you got me beat and, on that one. Yeah. And I, you know, and I will tell you, like, you know, I always say that, like, you know, you only glorify violence until you lose one bad fight. I lost, I was a competitive martial artist. I lost a tournament badly and had my face, my face got shattered and I had to get rebuilt. And I had 10 years of incredibly chronic, painful sinus infections as a result. Of that. And then I had to have the same surgery again. Like it, it, they're long, a decade's worth of consequences when these can, can result. And I agree with all those things. That's true. I've broken a lot of bones. I've suffered really bad consequences. Um, but I don't, you, I, that, I'm not saying you have to, you have to take the physical risk. You know what I mean? Like that's not a part of it. I, that's a personal choice. Risk-taking is foundational to performance. You're going to have to learn to get, because so negotiating with fear and working with fear, fear is such a great asset for performance for a lot of reasons. So you're going to have to start that negotiation process one way or another, because um, that's, that's sort of built in and baked into it. Um, does it have to be physical? No, there are, there are the, the only time that you really have to involve physicality is when you're training grit, right? Persistence. They're like, what do you, what, how do you, the grit, there are six different kinds of 
grit and they need to be all trained sort of in the beginning, especially independently. And the research is really clear. The first place you have to start training grit is physically. If you want to get grittier and more persistent at work, first thing you should do is figure out how to get grittier doing a physical task because the body, for whatever reason, especially with grit, doesn't seem to be the case with everything else, but with grit, um, you know, ultimately, if we're talking about business or entrepreneurship or any or most life lessons, the grit we really want is cognitive. How do I control my thoughts? How do I stop self rumination? How do I like that? How do I persist at, at work? And like, those are the kinds of grits that we want. But what the research says is the place you want to start training that is on the physical side. So that's the only, that's one of the only places, right, where you're actually going to have to do something physical on the path towards peak performance to start that process. Other than that, and that will require a little bit of risk, right? Because it may mean, you know, if you do sets of three sets of 10 at the gym, how do you get gritty? Well, tomorrow you do two sets of 10 and one set of 11. And then the next day you do two, one set of 10 and two sets of 11. And you just push a little bit, you know, and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. Um, and that's, you know, that's how, how, how we start to develop grit. One of the easy ways to start to develop grit, but. Well, let me ask you about, you talk in there, uh, you said the 1990s, you know, as you, as you are diving into this adventure sports athletes arena, just to take a mental grit perspective here, you said the. 1990s action and adventure sports athletes you knew came from extremely difficult backgrounds, generally broken homes, rough childhoods, had very little education, almost no money. And they routinely, though, do these impossible things. So it's very similar to uh, those folks who listen to Zig Ziglar. He tells a story a lot about just a survey done on great world leaders. And it was very similar. The 80% of them were found to come from, we can just say adverse you know, childhood experiences, ACE scores, as, as they say in the, in the health and wellness arena, that they had these. So, yeah, you know what I will tell you, you know, who I think has the hardest time after. So at the Flow Research Collective, we train about a thousand people a month. Okay. And so we have, besides the fact that we have like the science on the back, on the back end underneath the training, we train so many people from so many different walks of life that we have such enormous data sets across the boards okay. on, on all that stuff. And this, you know, who's, you know, who often has the hardest time with this stuff, people who had really easy childhoods. I, I was going to say it's the, the middle. It's yeah. That's you, if you was. had a really, if you were sort of like the, the star, well, start of the football team, football is enough of an uncomfortable sport that you probably, that but probably not. But if you had a really easy time in high school, you, you're going to it, it, you're going to find the rest of life a lot harder. I, as a general, rule, I have found easy childhood equates to more difficult adulthood and vice versa. Which is so difficult as a parent. I mean, we've seen this I and mean, you've seen this, you have the successful person who had these challenged childhoods. They had these adverse things happen. They over, if, if it didn't overcome them, which I would generally say it probably overcame more people, but the person that didn't, it made them stronger. They went, they achieved this great thing. They achieve a level of, I'll say abundance. And now their kids don't have to endure that. And we don't often see second generations of those achieve what that first generation of success did, which leaves me as a parent going, well, should I beat the crap out of my kid? Yeah, or I know. Yeah. I like you, right. It's, I, I was bullied a lot at school. You know what I mean? Like I, that was the thing I dealt with. Does that mean that I think bullying is a good thing? No, of course not. Right. You, it would, and it was, it was, it was terrible to experience, but on the back end, Oh my God, I don't get to be me if I don't come yeah. through that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Like if I, if I didn't get in, you know, hundreds of fights as a kid and lose most, I don't get to be me. Um, so was that pleasant? No, it was awful. It was terrible to go through it. But on the flip side, okay, I'll take it. Okay, so another one I'm enamored with in this. Well, you actually know on that note, I'm going to go back though. You said post-traumatic growth, which I, I, it rings a bell. Like I've heard that, but I haven't talked about that much. I mean, you're talking about these, let's take it back to those, back to these, these athletes or these world leaders or whatever that had these. Most people are going to have that trauma I don't know if that's fair to say most, but it feels like the majority of people will have that trauma and they will, they don't have the mental grit. Is that fair to say? And they develop PTSD as opposed to but changing. That's not, it's not really what happens. Most okay. people don't have that. I mean, 
trauma, most people eventually overcome trauma and it leads to growth. Okay. It takes a while and it's not pleasant, of course, um, but that's the vast, the vast majority of the time, you know, bad things happen to us and we get our ass kicked and we get back off the mat and we, and we, you know, and we move forward. And that's, that is most of us, most of the time. Uh, we it still doesn't change the fact that we like to glorify the, the story of it. And you know what I mean? That's sure. there's So there's a lot, there, there's, there's a lot of that, I think going around that's not. And, and by the way, that's not the work I do. I always said that the work I do um, is we take you from zero up to Superman, right? There's an entire field of psychology that takes you from subpar back to normal. That's not the work I do. And, you know, and if you come to the Flow Research Collective and, you know, we, I mean, every, if you train with us, everybody trains with either a PhD psychologist or neuroscientist. And we will, you know, if, if that, those are your issues, we'll say, look, you, you should get outside help. We don't do that. That's not, that's not our work in the world. So I'm always cautious about staying in my lane and speaking to things where I have, you know, absolute deep expertise. But post-traumatic growth okay. is where, is, is generally what happens. Um, on the on the backside of trauma, it it very rarely ling leads to this lingering. You know, I got crushed by this bad thing that happened, for the basic reason that bad things happen to all of us. Yeah. I have yet, you know, one of the great things about I started my career as a journalist, and I, you know, I was a journalist for twenty years. You get my I had an old editor that used to say the great thing about being a journalist is you get to walk through the kingdom, and what he basically meant is you get to meet everybody. And you meet everybody, and I, I've met everyone anywhere. I've, you know, had lunch and dinner with kings and prime ministers and, you know, Nobel laureates and on and on and on and on and on. And I have not, ever, it's hard for everybody. It's hard here. Planet Earth is a tough place to be. Nobody has an easy time. I haven't met anybody who has an easy time here. I really haven't. Um, it's hard here. And I don't, and trauma is entirely relative. You can't judge somebody else's trauma from the outside and however you want, you want to do it because you can't judge somebody's own internal experience of the world from the outside. Yeah. So I don't, um, it's not where I play. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not the work I do. It's not my deep expertise. I try to stay in my lane, but you know, these are some, some thoughts from the outside. Well, to this aspect of trying things and pushing our potential, I mean, you just said earth, you know, it's hard here. You also made a, a little state. I don't know if it was a quote that you cited or, or one that you said that I pulled out, but I just appreciate it. It looked like a, a great bumper sticker. More meaningful does not mean more pleasant. And yet that's where the culture seems to be driven. Where can we have more pleasantness, more comfort, more ease, that's what sells. That's what's on the commercials. That's what's on the media for the most part is that we're not often pushing. I think people are enamored, like you said, with the amazing, but they're not always drawn to it. They're we're as a culture more prone to just sit on the couch and watch it. Yeah. So flow, which is at the center of the work oh. I do. Uh, it's worth talking a little bit about flow. Now uh, flow states are, correlated so there's the so positive psychologists basically say look there are three levels of happiness that are available to anybody on planet earth level one is just happiness it's hedonic pleasure moment by moment how do you feel right now how do you feel right now how do you feel right now and what we've learned by we meaning the entire field of psychology and, and positive psychology over the past 30 years is there's not dan harris was sort of right you can be about 10% happier, right? That's about like, but there's not a whole lot of wiggle room. You have these things known as emotional set points and they're, they're created by nature and nurture and you have a low point and a high point and most of your life is going to take place in between, right? These are all the emotions are, there's not a whole lot you can do to really move them around. There are a few things and, and we can go into that if you want to, but how the happiness, how do you feel right here? There's not a whole lot you can do and the next level up is what's known as enjoyment or engagement. This is literally defined as a high flow lifestyle. So this could be any, you could be a computer coder and coding could give you a lot of flow. You could be, you know, I live in, in Tahoe and tons of the people around me are carpenters um, or work construction over the summer 
sort of flowy jobs if you're really interested in working with your hands, but they do it so they can ski all winter or snowboard all winter, yeah. right? And that's a high flow lifestyle. The level above that is meaning and purpose. And that's a high flow lifestyle where the thing that is producing the most flow is coupled to a cause greater than yourself. Okay, now, uh, so we've just defined the three levels of happiness that are available to all of us on the planet. Now let's talk about flow for half a second. Flow, which is the state of optimal performance, meaning we feel our best and we perform our best. We can talk way more about it, but the thing I wanna cover here is that flow states not only underpin optimal performance, they have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. If you want more flow in your life, these triggers are your toolkit. One of the most important is what's known as the challenge skills balance. The idea here is pretty simple. Simple. All of flow can only happen when all of our attention is focused on the right here, right now, the present moment. And we pay the most attention to the present when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set. You want to stretch, but not snap. Now, slightly exceed your skill set means you want to push your skills to the edge and just a little outside your comfort zone, a little outside your comfort zone, a little outside your comfort zone. If you are always, if you're living a high flow lifestyle, which we know correlates directly to the second and third, the upper levels of, of, of life satisfaction while being attainable, flow shows up when you're actually by definition uncomfortable. You literally have to be pushing outside. And you know this as a mountain biker, right? When you're riding right on the edge of your skill set, that's when you're paying the most attention. But it's also physically often very uncomfortable, right? And if, even if you think about flow as an athlete, like if I'm in flow as a skier, I'm in flow on the run. Often when I'm on the chairlift, my muscles are aching and I feel terrible in between these bouts of flow, right? Because I'm, I'm working so hard kind of thing. That's not pleasure. That's not like the, all that comfort, all those things. But what it is, is directly correlated to meaning and purpose. We know that the people who score off the charts for overall well-being and life satisfaction are the people with the most flow in their lives. And if you're going to have the most flow in your life, you are going to be by design uncomfortable a lot of the time. Can you experience flow with shy of a significant level of mastery? Yes, yes, but, but. So flow is sort of shows up as we level up our skills. So flow is gonna show up every, as we walk the path to mastery. The better and better and better you get at the thing you're doing, the more reliable and repeatable flow is going to be, okay. right? There, at the front end of the learning curve, you can have longer plateaus without flow. And the real, this is, the real answer is not so much about flow, it's about learning skills and things along the way, right? So there's a whole one quarter of The Art of Impossible is devoted yeah. to learning skills. One of the things, so, it's interesting, flow amplifies all the things with motivation, learning, creativity is usually amplified by flow. This is, uh, you asked that question earlier on about was there an aha insight? This was one of the big aha insights. So I've been training people in flow and using how do you use the flow triggers to get more flow in your life for a very long time. And I probably, I think you could make the argument that I probably taught more people about this stuff than anybody else alive at this point. Um, I always like to say, Mihai Chick sent me high, the guy who coined the term flow and right, wrote the book flow. He has to, over the course of his career, he basically had to define flow once or twice a semester. When he is introduction to flow course, he would have to like walk into that classroom and flow is blah, blah. As a general, I have to define flow four times a day, five times a day and have for 20 years, right? Um, and my point in all this is, uh, I don't know what my point in all this was, but uh, what I wanted, so when I, when we started using the neuroscience to train up flow, very early on, we discovered, wow, this stuff is really trainable. Like if you go back to the nineties, when people were going from the psychology, trying to train flow and eh, mixed results, very mixed, not reliable, not repeatable. Sometimes we got it. Sometimes we didn't, couldn't figure it out. But once in around 2007, 2008, as the neuroscience, the starts like we really start understanding 
oh, this is where it's coming from. This is, this is where the state's, how it works. It starts to get very reliable and repeatable. I can, you know, if we, if I put somebody through zero to dangerous, for example, our core flow training, I know I can get a 70, 80% boost in flow on the, on the back end because we train so many people and we measure flow pre and post, and we use the standard psychological instruments. But here's the interesting thing. It's not, that huge burst is not sustainable by most people. And I couldn't figure out why for the longest time. I was like, wow, you can train this stuff up, huge increases, but a lot of people can't sustain it. And I was like, well, who, like I started to notice certain people were able to sustain it. And everybody, and the issue isn't the flow stuff, it's the other skills that flow amplifies. It's like, if you've got a car, right? Normal life takes place at 25 miles an hour, flow takes place at 150 miles an hour. The problem is, if you've got like bicycle tires on your car, it's fine at 25 right. miles an hour, but you supercharge it to 150 miles an hour, those bicycle tires, you need a solid foundation. So flow amplifies motivation, grit, and goal setting, learning, and creativity. But if, for example, if you don't know how to learn well, flow takes place when we push our skills to the utmost, right? This is a, this is a fecund learning rich environment, but if you actually don't know how to learn well, and you're not learning while you're doing that stuff, you can't keep pace with the acceleration that flow is gonna provide. And you're gonna, that's where your car is gonna come off the tracks kind of thing. So it's interesting that the trying, that you're asking less a question about flow and more a question about learning, okay. but it often, it, it, it seems like it's a question about flow um, for less than obvious reasons. But you know, the, in terms of, I do think it's true. I, you know, I more meaningful doesn't mean more pleasant. And we know this. And here's, here's the great thing. Here's the, I ask people this all the time. I ask people to tell me the things that happened to them in their life, that they're proudest of, and that made the biggest difference afterwards, right? Tell me about the thing that you did that was like, that you're proudest of, and that offered the greatest, you know, unlocked the greatest number of doors after. Do you know what you never hear? Oh, there was this time I got lucky and won the lotto or oh, right, right. you right? you hear, oh, there was this thing I worked for four years yeah. and I, it was super difficult, it was super, and, but it changed everything. That's the stories you always tell. Yeah. We like the stuff we sweat for. We value it more and it changes us more. And we all know that. We all know this from our own experiences. We don't remember the nights that we just chilled at home and watched TV in our comfy couch in our pajamas, right? That those are not the nights that stick in our memory. Um, but the night that, you know, you got out and climbed a mountain to watch the, you know, the, the eclipse at midnight and it was hard and it was cold and it was scary or whatever. That's the night that sticks in your memory. Yeah. <laughs> so many pieces of that, Stephen. I, I do want to bubble up a little bit to, Again, just a basic statement. It wasn't a, I, I'm not going to put it out there as, as a brilliant statement, it, but it's so profound. The reason, you, page 13 in your book, the reason we're not living up to our potential is that we're not in the habit of living up to our potential. It's, you know, success begets success type thing. Actually, I just talked to you earlier today, who I think you talked to him recently too, uh, Ben Hardy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mentioned I you, and he's, I think he said you talked recently. Well, in his recent book, Personality Isn't Permanent, and he talks so much. You know, he really tries to debunk this. You know, again, just genetics. I am what I am. This is how I was born. This is how I was wired. He says so much of your personality is just what you say yes to, what you decide to do, and what you do routinely. The daily habits make up you know your personality. So back over here on potential that we're seeing these people who experience that pushing their potential, increasing their potential. And they, that begets doing it more while we have so many who never do that. And they're just not into the routine. I just have never heard it said that basically, I mean, that's, that's not a brilliant, what, this is like so, a Malcolm Gladwell outliers, 10,000 hours. It's not the brilliant. It's just those who do. So here's, I mean, you have to, in any given situation, there's not a whole, you have your focus and attention. What am I going to pay attention to? And what am I going to ignore? And then you have your action. And if you put your focus and your action and, and you repeat it over and over and over again, you get a habit. That's essentially the entire peak performance toolkit. There's more stuff and whatever, but that's, those are the things you have to work with. And 
Um, if you look at, so why is motivation such a big deal? Why is curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, what, like, why do they matter so much? Because they give you focus for free. Because you only, in any situation, you have your focus and you have your action. Actions, as we know, if you're going to do tasks X, it's going to require a certain amount of energy. Yes, you can get more efficient and learn over time and get better at it. But as you know, that's a slow, gradual process. So the big lever you have is your attention. Why does curiosity and passion and purpose matter so much? Because we pay more attention to things we're curious about automatically. You don't have to work to, to do it, right? Yeah. The point about the habit of inferiority, which is what you're talking about, right? The fact that like we're not in the habit of living up to our fullest potential. This was a comment originally made by William James, the kind of godfather of American psychology. And he said, look, most people don't know. Everybody knows we've got a second wind, right? Because you've heard about it. Maybe you've, you've had that experience. But what you probably don't know is you have a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and you're not in the habit of, because you don't push that hard routinely, you have no idea once again, what you're capable of, right? And that, that, was, that was James's point. And it's excellence is a habit. It's, like any, it's just like anything else. You just have to practice it. And you practice it a very tiny little bit at a time. Yeah, I think one of the best gifts I ever got was being a pro cyclist. And if anybody knows that you're with the pack, if you get out of the pack, you lose the draft, you're gone. And I mean, you can't, you can't come to your limit and, and stop or you're gone. You have to go past that and doing that over and over and over was probably one of the best training grounds for life I've ever had. And, and it's a gift most people don't have, you know, with this talking about motivation, you've talked about that in your book and, and well, for everybody listening, uh, you know, the book is, is segmented out motivation, learning, creativity, and flow is the sequential, um, line there, but motivation you then break out too. And I wrote those out and you have drive. We, we talked about it a bit today, drive and grit and goals. The one I am most curious about in this industry of personal development, self-help, health and wellness, that is my vocational pursuit is drive. It is ultimately saying, what do we, how do we find that? Well, just, just like back to the person who had the adverse effects as a kid, and you've got 10 people who had these and nine of them, it wrecked and overcame. And one of them, for some reason, we don't often know, decided, hey, you know, I want to do something. I'm going to do something positive for that. It's going to be post-traumatic growth and not keep me down. That right there is where we have so many people listening right now who've been listening to stuff and reading stuff for so many years. And they're frustrated with their own inability, it seems like to them, to have enough drive to do what it takes. And so when we put that out there and talk about it, I, I'm always wanting to go there. How do we, what's the formula for that? I mean, you're talking about this in a formula. It's not so a formula. I, here, I mean, we can spend some time here, but the simple, so the opening of the book, right? The, the first three or four chapters talk about curiosity is our foundational motivator. Yeah. It's where things start. Curio when you, if you can find the intersection of multiple curiosities, that's where passion is. And I like that exercise. That right. There, and yeah. yeah, by the way, it's, this is what I was going to offer you is if you can, if you want to send your listeners to passionrecipe.com, the first chunk of the book, because so many people have found that useful. How do I turn curiosity, passion and passion into purpose? How do I find my purpose? That yeah. question we get all the time. Um, and it's, you got to, this is where peak performance starts. It's got, it starts right here. So the passionrecipe.com is a, is a, is a, we, it's an interactive a workbook designed to exactly do this. It's online. It's free. Um, it's for it's for anybody listening. Uh, so that one, you don't have to just like listen to us talk about what this is. You can go, you know, run the experiment for yourself. Mm -hmm. But people get it. They get it wrong for a lot of reasons. People. One of the main reasons people get passion and purpose so wrong is they have the wrong image of it. And I, uh, so if you if I say you know. Can I have an example, Kevin, of athletic uh, passion? You know, you'll give me LeBron James, right, from the recent finals, windmilling in for, uh, for a dunk, you know, over some poor defender's head. And you're like, that's what athletic passion looks like. And you're right and you're wrong. 
that is what the end point of athletic passion looks like, but that's not what it looks like at the front end. Mm -hmm. At the front end, it looks like a little kid in a driveway, shooting a ball through a hoop, trying to get the ball through. That's what passion mm -hmm. always looks like on the front end. And we want it to feel on the inside at the front end, what it looks like from the outside at the back end. Right. right? Okay. We think, oh yeah, well, I don't feel that passion for this thing. So this must not be my thing. And we don't realize that it, passion is something that is cultivated over time. It's a, it's a fire you feed. It's not a thing that just like drops into your lap. So that front end passion, and I'm glad you pulled that out because you have that. I didn't know about the website, but yeah, you have in the book, the taking the curiosity and questioning that you actually had another one in there there was another i thought i had it written down there was another work like working this out it wasn't um it wasn't uh curiosity it was another one like i don't know if it was passion i'm looking through my notes here but it was another thing of working things out and looking for those intersections which i thought was curious oh uh, that was that was uh maybe in the five books is stupid which was a. Uh a place, uh, a way to, to sort of uh, knowledge acquisition. It was a system for knowledge acquisition. Both of them require playing at the intersections of curiosities. Okay. That though, that front end of passion. Now I love how you put that because yeah, we look at that. We hear from people by the time they've reached the back end of, 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 of passion like that. That's who they read the books or listening to the sure. podcast and reading the blogs, but about the front end, we have so many people, so many of us in, in some capacity, sitting at the front end of going, how do I stoke that fire? So that was the exercise of looking at those areas yeah, the passion of recipe. curiosity. Okay. I, I know what the other one was, it was looking at what is a, like a big problem in the world. That you oh, that's like how you, yeah. Well, that's how you, passion. I mean, there are a bunch of neurobiological reasons for this, but like passion is the intersection of multiple curiosities. When you find that intersection of multiple curiosities and then you attach it to one of the big problems in the world that you're really, you'd really like to get solved. Now you've got a formula for, for purpose. Yeah. And you know, purpose, uh, purpose gets a lot of attention. It gets a lot of, we like to mystify purpose. We like to make purpose all mystical and all spiritual and all things like that. Um, and those things might be true. I'm not saying those things aren't true. I'm saying, from a performance standpoint, purpose matters for very, very selfish reasons. Purpose is very good for performance. Neurobiologically, when we have purpose, we get bigger reward chemicals than we do alone from just passion. So purpose actually is more satisfying, more meaningful, produces greater well-being and life satisfaction on the back end. And for the exact reason, we pay more attention to things that are aligned with our purpose than just aligned with our passion. And there's a couple other reasons. So the purpose, it's got this very selfless, altruistic sort of reputation in the world. And, and you see a lot of like, you know, younger generations, you get a lot of virtue signaling, right? People will lead with, they'll go into meetings and hi, my name is Sarah and I'm here to save the world or I'm here to feed the poor. And I'm always like, oh my God, what are you doing? Shut up, don't do that. Like, no, don't do that. First of all, it's bad from a performance standpoint to talk about your big goals like that out loud. It's not very useful. It's demo, it tends to be demotivating. Um, but uh, it also, um, it, I, I don't, I, it, it, it freaks me out and they, they turn purpose into something that is like, it's a focusing mechanism. Yeah. It's a focusing mechanism. I'm like, it seems all lofty and altruistic. It's a focusing mechanism. It's how we get more focus for less energy. Well, I want to land here. When you talk about this as your first book, that was a how to in essence, uh, different than I did a little bit. A bold was sort of a how to on the disrupt. How do you harness disruptive technology to build exponential companies and things like that? Yeah. So I did a little bit of that work, but that was a very shared project because I was co-writing with Peter Diamandis and we were not, we were drawing a lot on research that had come out of Singularity University and things like that. And um, I also don't necessarily know if we knew exactly what we were talking about quite yet because exponential technology was super new when we were writing it. So we were writing about what we were watching work, but I don't know if we had all the answers yet. Yeah. Well, on this, coming back to a formula that you're mm -hmm. trying to say, what is the formula 
for peak performance that I don't know if this will do it justice. I'll let you do it justice, but I, I wanted people to hear too, that it wasn't, you, you, you're not making it simplistic. I mean, I hope that through this discussion, they're hearing that you're not saying that this is, this is not comfortable. This is not easy. And that this is a formula. It's not as simple as taking this ingredient and this ingredient pouring it into the cauldron and boom, you've got this. It's more like the uh, algebraic formula that's going to take pages and pages to work it out. But there are specific, so you know, it's interesting. When I say it's a formula, what I literally mean is there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to get in the game, like the passion recipe, right? There's a, there are some onboarding, there's some onboarding things and there's some skills that you're going to have to train up along the way. But by the end of the art of impossible, right? After you've waded through all the how to, you discover that there are six things you got to do every day and seven things you got to do every week. And most of the six things that you have to do every day are like, it'll take about five minutes to do some of these things, or you do other, other things built inside of the activity, um, where the activity is just like a frame, a container for, you know, what, whatever you need to get done inside of it um, kind of thing. That's what I mean by it's a formula. It's literally like if we want to be at our absolute best and, and be able to bring that forward if there's not that much what's hard about peak performance and you know this from your time as a professional athlete it's when i the interesting thing about the impossible is i always say this to people if you've managed to sort of live to age 30 35 right you've already experienced probably the the worst that life is gonna it's not gonna get much harder right it doesn't matter the size of the goal you take on you've already experienced the suck that is life. There's no secret. It's not gonna like you're suddenly gonna open a door and suddenly it's gonna suck so much more than it's ever sucked before. And you, it just it's a limited amount of suckiness in this sense. Um, it, I mean, yes, there are there are tra there are occasional tragedies that are very you know death of a child, death of a spouse, chronic unemployment. There are certain things that are very difficult to bounce to come back through. Um, but again, the same formula, by the way, how do you do it? Same formula applies, by the way. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's, it's shocking how that it's not that much harder. To, I always say it is just as hard to be like the best dry cleaner in Cleveland, Ohio, as the guy who unlocks the space frontier. It really, like, it is literally the same amount of hard. It doesn't get harder when the vision gets bigger. It may take a little longer, but it doesn't actually get harder in a, in a physical, actual, real way. Yeah. Um, the harder, it, it may seem harder. And the truth of the matter is the sixth thing, the difficulty is in the repetition. It's doing it every day again and again and again and again and again. That's where the, the true difficulty is um, for people not in the actual things that you're doing because the things that you actually have to do for to unlock peak performance in yourself are not that damn hard. Yeah. You've already done harder stuff. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate it. I, I, I appreciate how you put the book together, how you laid out the formula and your research is, uh, is incredible. That's, that's why you're here. I have, uh, I've learned. That's my favorite thing. I get to sit here and learn and it's great to connect uh, with you as well. Where do you want me to send people? So um, art of the art of impossible.com. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if people are interested in more flow, um, we can, uh, so if flowblocker.com is a diagnostic, there are six major flow blockers, basically things standing between you and more flow. Everybody's usually guilty of one or two of them. And finally, we were just like, you know what? Let's just make a diagnostic because everybody wants more flow and let's just create an easy diagnostic. So we bought, I built to, to give away with this book. We built a bunch of pre-performance tools that were just, you know, giving to people. So passionrecipe.com, flowblocker.com, theartofimpossible.com. If you want to send them to my website, it's stephencotler.com. If they're interested in training with the Flow Research Collective, flowresearchcollective.com. Okay. We will list those out where here, we Kevin, can. I will give you here. Let me just do this. I'm going to put this in our chat bar. 
you open it. So, and this, these will, I'll give you a bunch of URLs. Um, yeah. Got it. Okay. Got it. Cool. Beauty. Hey, thank you. Hey uh, man. Thank you. Super fun. Yeah. And, uh, have, I hope you have a good Christmas and I hope you're going to have a killer new year. I'm, I'm, I'm eager for it. I'm and remember, it. remember, take too many drugs and drive recklessly. Good. I have not had that counsel yet. I, 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 I just want to give you the counsel that nobody else is going to give you. Okay. I try to tell, I just, it's simple. And I try to tell the truth. Well, I, I can go home and pass it on to the kids. So that, I'll pay it, which I'll is pay always, they, I always tell people I'm not childproof. <laughs> Don't bring me into the room with your children. I'm really not, I'm not safe. Great. I'm not, not safe around children. Well, safe for the whole family has never been that exciting. So, uh, Stephen, well, again, thank you so much. I hey, really thank you for it. your interest. I really appreciate I, I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the heart you brought to the topic. So thank you. Oh, my, my honor, truly. Okay. Hope you have a blessed next engagement. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.